Then everybody else has to suffer because you guys are selfish. Now I have to go through all my stuff again. Um, no, I'll be quick about it, though. So welcome. We're going to go ahead and start because we are at time. And they only, right? It is 2... Oh, wait. Or is it 2.30 that I'm supposed to start? Oh. Well, then, then we got nine minutes. And I, as I always say, I'm terrified of silence. So let's do questions if anybody has a question. You've been at a convention for three days. You have to have a question about writing. Somebody, please, or I'm going to stare at you really awkwardly for nine minutes. <laughs> and that's not good for either one of us. Yes? Well, I explained showing and not telling. So I did an entire 45-minute class on it two days ago, and that was like one-tenth of what I normally do in my show-don't-tell class. So um, we could either do that, or I could do this class, because there's kind of not enough time. Um, basically... The, the thing I start off with that class is I say, the difference between showing versus telling is with telling, you're merely cataloging actions, feelings, emotions, and events. Showing is where you paint the picture and allow the reader's imagination to place the reader in the middle of and experience the moment. That really is kind of the difference between the two. And then there's just a crap ton of stuff. Now, normally, I don't let conventions put my stuff online for too long. So like this one, I think only had my classes up last month or last year for like two months or whatever. Um, I do the same thing for like Comic-Con, but the class that I gave them back in 2020 is my Show Don't Tell class, and it is still on YouTube. So if you really want to get my long form answer to that, go to YouTube, look up Max Alexander Drake, Comic-Con, 2020 or Comic-Con at home or whatever, and you'll see that class, and it's free, and that's what I would recommend. It is probably my most popular class. People love it. So that would be your answer to that one. Next question. What top three things do you think writers Get a real job. Listen to your mother. Be good. Be kind to others. No, um, whew, that is a tough one. Um, I'll tell a story, and then I'll start the class. So I had somebody reach out to me a couple years ago, who was like, "I'm a huge fan of your training, and I and I just you know I've gotten good enough as a writer that I wrote a creative writing book, and and I'd really like the last chapter be you. I want to send you a bunch of questions, and I will you know." I'll have you answer them, and that'll be the last chapter. And I was like, great. And so I got the list of questions, and I was like, okay, yeah, obviously this guy is a fan of mine. Because the first question was, you meet a person who just wrote their first book. What is your advice to them? And so I wrote, throw it in the garbage and write your next book. Because that's what your first book is going to be. It's going to be terrible. It just is. And when I sent it back to him, he was like, wait a minute, you, I, I can't. Like, you can't say this to an up-and-coming writer. I said, literally, I've made a career out of saying that to up-and-coming writers. It's because it's the truth. It's the way it is. We all have things that we need to learn and grow, and your first book is just not good enough. It's not good enough to charge for. And I realize there's probably sitting in this audience right now that have published your first book, and that's fine. And I'm just, this is my opinion on it. Um, but that is what I feel. You know, I feel that you need time to grow. It takes time. It doesn't take... So it takes 10 years to really, really get good at this stuff. It does. And that's not me saying this. Everyone has said this since the dawn of time. Ray Bradbury, Stephen King, um, whoever. I mean, there's, there's a list of, of people who have said, write a million words, pour, pour your soul into them, and then throw it away, and you're ready to start writing professionally. A million words is 10 novels, if the average novel is 100,000 words. Ten novels of writing and editing takes about ten years if you're going to do it right. It doesn't take ten years to learn the stuff that I talk about. It doesn't. Like, you shouldn't author intrude unless it's a plot device in the entire story, but if it's not, author intruding is bad. Understanding that is not hard. What is hard is you have to get to the point where you're no longer thinking about this stuff. All this stuff that I've been talking about these last couple of days, I don't think about any of this crap when I'm writing. None of it. Because I've been doing it for 30 years. It's no longer in my vocabulary. Um, and that's why it takes so long. So that first book that you wrote has a ton of mistakes in it and has a ton of problems in it that you didn't even know existed in that book. But you'll learn. One of the weird things 
about this industry that has always baffled me is we cannot see above us in skill level. We can only see below. And it's easy to prove because every single one of you, if you've been writing for a while, have read something you wrote a year ago and it reads like crap. Why does it read like crap? It didn't read like crap a year ago. It read really, really good a year ago because you couldn't see anything above you. You can only see below you. And since it was the exact equal with you of where you were a year ago, it read great. You were like, man, this is just as good as Brandon Sanderson's work. You're not even playing the same sport as Brandon Sanderson. But you can't see that. A year from now, you look back on it and you're like, oh my god, this is horrible. It didn't mold on your computer over the last year. It literally is the same thing. You are just now better and so therefore you can see below you because that is now below you. Which is why I always say, if you read something you wrote a year ago and it still reads really good, you should be afraid. Because that means you have not grown as a writer in a year. It should always read bad. That's why when people say to me, I was like, what, what's your favorite thing you've ever written? I'm like, the thing I'm writing right now, everything else sucks. Everything. Like, the one that I haven't published yet is awesome. Everything else is garbage. Uh, please buy it, because, you know, I need to <laughs> pay for my kids' college. But, you know, it's... It is, and so it just takes time. Um, yeah, I got a few minutes. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Um, I'll put that down. I'm obviously touching something. Um, I have something that I call, there's a lot of Drake-isms. You hang out with me, you'll hear a lot of Drake-isms. Uh, my assistant's actually writing a book, which I think is hilarious, called Drake-isms. There's five stages of editing grief. Just like there's five stages of grief, there's five stages of editing grief that you will have to go through. Now, the problem is, is that you'll have to go through these with every single aspect of writing. So author intrusion is one of them. Using too many pronouns or using pronouns incorrectly is another. You know, punctuation, whatever. There's a billion things that we have to learn as writers. And every one of them, you have to go through these steps, sort of. The first one is a catch-all. The first one is you have to be willing to take criticism. You have to. There's no way around it. Because if you can't take criticism in a writer's group or whatever, guess what happens when you publish something on Amazon? Those people don't know you and don't care about you, and their criticism gets to stay up forever. There's no way to get rid of it. So when they say something like, I'm giving this book one star only because it was, you know, I would give it zero stars, but it won't let me, and I must tell you how terrible this book is. So I'm giving it one, like, that's a horrible review. Um, once you can get over the fact that you're ready to be critiqued, you're actually over that for everything. That's the one nice thing about it. If you're in a writer's group, everybody knows that you have one person in your writer's group that, that just won't take critiques. Like, I don't even know why they keep coming back to the writer's group, because they come back, they read, and you go, well, you're doing this wrong. And they go, I think you're wrong. I'm not going to listen to you. Like, why are you even come here? And by the way, if you don't have that in your writer's group, it might be you. Just, just letting you know. Because every writer's group has one. But the other four stages you have to go through with everything. And that's why you have to be in a writer's group. You have to critique others and be critiqued because it's the only way to go through these four stages. When you reach level two is when you start being able to see the mistake in other people's writing. So in other words, you're willing to hear that you author intrude and it's bad. Great, you've gotten over stage one. Now you're starting to go, wait a minute, you author intruded in that, right there, I recognize that. Welcome to stage two. You can see it in other people's writing. You will still author intrude. You will still do it horribly, and you won't ever see it. But you're seeing it in other people's writing. You know you're at stage three when you start catching it in your own stuff. You'll be like editing something for the seventh time, and you're like, oh, wait, that's author intrusion. How did I miss that in the first six editing passes? Welcome to stage three. You can now start seeing it in your own writing. Stage four is when you start catching yourself as you write it. When you start making those mistakes and you're catching them as they're coming onto the page, welcome to stage four. Stage five is when it's no longer in your vocabulary. You just don't do it anymore. That's stage five. It takes time. It takes time to get all those. And so that's, I think, the number one thing that a lot of writers miss is that, yes, we live in an indie press world. Yes, we can self-publish. Yes, we can do all this amazing stuff. But are you ready? Are you being kind to your reader by using them as your training ground? You know, that's up to you. Um, I am not that way. For me, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars working on the Drake brand. 
Um, I know I have friends that are, that are authors that, that were so horribly reviewed that they had to change their author name to something else so that they could then publish something else and actually sell them because they had so many one-star and two-star reviews. I don't want to waste the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've spent on my brand because Drake brand is just like Nike, just like McDonald's, just like whatever, and I don't want to lose that. And so I always want to put out that high quality, and I don't want to put out you know, something that I don't feel confident enough to have my name on. So that's, I think, the number one thing. I know you asked for three, but that's one. You've got to be self-critical of when you're actually ready, especially in the self-publishing game, because there is no gatekeeper. There's no one to tell you you're not good enough. It's just you. And so you have to be that gatekeeper. You have to be the one that, that can at least look at your own work and go, is it actually ready for mass consumption? And I think a lot of people miss that. And again, I know that makes me the bad guy in this room. I'm sorry. I will always be truthful, even if everyone hates me for it. All right, so let's get into this. Starting it off on such a positive note. Um, like I said, this, I have never given this class, so we're going to have an adventure here and see if this actually works. For those that are new, I do have, if you like the way I teach, um, I do have a couple resources you can buy. Uh, I'll, I'll be out here for another 30 minutes to an hour before I go home tonight. But if you want to get one of my books, you can get them from Amazon or whatever, they're 25. You can get them from 20 from me. Dynamic story creation is all theoretical. It's about story structure and theme and what makes a story work and what makes a story not work. It's actually required reading in several divisions of Disney, so people say it's pretty good. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about uh, in prose, some of it is in here. Um, better writing through stronger narrative. This is a lot about understanding narrative and understanding how to take advantage of narrative, but this is very prose specific, so novels, short stories. I do have a piece of fiction. Uh, Snurse a magical, magical, magical fairy tale. If you like kind of very, it is a children's thing, but every adult loves it too. Um, but if you like fantasy adventure, but really kind of geared toward children, um, it's a great story. It's probably my favorite story I've ever written. If you go to drakeu.com, there is a big package. I have had cancer for the last year, so I haven't had a chance to, we just launched this before I went down, and so I'm just trying to get back to it and get some stuff recorded, so stuff will start hitting it soon. But there is a big package on there. It's about 42 lessons, like 10 hours of video. It's 260 bucks, but if you use the code 20books22, you can get 50% off of that. So if you want to pick that up, this code is going to be good for about two months, I think is what we set it for. So if it's something you want to do, you can. I also have a podcast, Releasing Your Inner Dragon. It's available for free everywhere. There's probably 60 to 70 hours worth of podcast out there now. So tons of me and another author, Marie. She's a Finnish author, brilliant woman. Um, we met a couple years ago because she invited me as a guest on her uh, YouTube channel, and we just clicked, and like a week later, we were doing a podcast together. A lot of really cool, interesting stuff. It's also on YouTube under the same name, Releasing Your Inner Dragon. I'm doing a monthly open Q&A, so if you ever just want to sit down with me for a couple hours, the first Tuesday of every month, you do have to sign up for it. You go to starvingwriterstudio.com forward slash Zoom, and you can sign up for it. They'll send you the link. First Tuesday of every month, I will be there answering questions and talking. The, I am going to be recording these, and they are going up on the YouTube channel, so if you subscribe to Drake U, the only video that's up right now is the November Q&A, because I just started it. So it's two hours of me answering questions. You can watch that. I am going to be launching a um, questions of the day on that same YouTube channel. So they're about 10 minutes long where I answer one question. I am looking for questions. So if you do want to send questions for me to answer, I would love you to death. Questions with an S at drakeu.com. I will start answering those questions. I've got about 20 of them recorded. I want to record another 15 to 20 more before I start dropping them so that I can always stay ahead. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, so let's get into it. Oh, crap, no, there's always that one other thing. So we've been doing some giveaways. Uh, if you go to drakeu.com forward slash giveaway, you can sign up for this. Today's prize, which is the grand prize, is the package that's online for free. So that $260 package, you would get that for free. You also get a one-on-one -on -one consult with me for three or four hours where we do what I normally do with my private consultants, where I look at your writing, I talk to you about whatever you want to talk about, we spend time together one-on-one, -on -one, and we go through whatever, really whatever you're looking to, to go through. So. Good luck, hopefully you can uh, get in on that giveaway and we'll go from there. So, I start off all my class with a quote. This one's from Winston Churchill. Men, f I, yeah. So, men will forgive a man anything except bad prose. I feel like I gave, I, I read this earlier, but I did, didn't I? Yeah, but that means that I screwed up when I was making it and I erased a different one and put it in here. But, so there should have been another 
quote on another one of my other classes this, the, from either this morning or earlier. So sorry, you don't get that quote. So same quote from earlier, whenever it was, either this morning or yesterday. Um, and again, I put that quote in there. I don't really have a lot of reasons for it. I just like it. So what is the point of structure? For me, the reason why we want to write structure, I kind of see it as eating food. Now, I do have a restaurant background. I grew up in restaurants, and so a lot of things that I do are, are geared toward that. But that's the way I see structure in prose. So sentences, paragraph, punctuation, for what they really allow me to do is to force my reader to swallow. So when I hit you with a comma or hit you with a period, I'm going to give you this information and you're going to consume it. At the end of a sentence, you're going to consume it. At the end of a paragraph, you're going to consume it. At the end of a scene, you're going to consume that. And you're going to put that away in your little brain vault. And so that's, you know, I talked a lot over these last couple of days about I control my readers. I control what they feel, when they feel, how they feel it. One of the tools that I use for that is actual structure. So what I really want to do with this one is break it down further and actually go into a paragraph and kind of give you my views on what a paragraph is, how to use a paragraph to its most effectiveness, and, and get the most out of it and really understand what we're doing to control the readers. So that's really what this class is about. This class is a lesson in how to control readers. So what is a paragraph? A paragraph delivers a particular idea or topic to a reader in a very clear way that is unique and specific to that one paragraph. That's what it is. That's kind of the definition of it. Normally, when you talk about paragraphs, they, they break it down into three sentence types. You have topic sentence, which is your opening sentence. You have your supporting sentences, and you have a concluding sentence. But that is boring to me. That's more like writing an essay. That, to me, that has nothing to do with creative writing. So scratch all that, because that's too formal for me. I am too chaotic in my creative writing. But there are a lot of things that I like to think about when I am writing a paragraph. So what I put together was nine kind of thinking points that I feel are kind of the nine most important things to think about when you're crafting your paragraphs. So thinking point one, and this is the number one mistake that I see new writers making all the time. A paragraph is a sliver of, of time, a moment. Now, it could be long, it could be short. I mean, it could be, and then the months passed as the snow fell and then melted away. That could be one paragraph. And that's a lot amount of time, but it's still one absolutely related piece of information that the reader is consuming. And then we're going to move on after that. Most prose, most paragraphs are going to be a millisecond or a second in time or two seconds in time or whatever. But no matter what, when you are dealing with dialogue and characters, a paragraph is one character's actions and dialogue. One. It's how we delineate things. So in other words, if we wrote, ow, our dairy rubbed the spot on his arm where Silm punched him. His cousin kept his voice low so as not to be overheard. Don't assume this makes us even, pretty boy. Rolling his eyes, our dairy followed his cousin to the same door Layla had disappeared through. Don't be a prairie worm in both mind and stomach, Silm. Eyes only helping. You know, our dairy crashed into Silm as the older boy came to an abrupt stop. You get lost. You don't really have the ability to follow and this is just two boys, two brothers that are kind of the technically cousins, but two brothers. And by the way, all these examples I just pulled from my latest current thing that I'm writing. So there may be some horrid typos in this stuff because I did just make this yesterday. Um, and this is pretty much un, uh, unedited stuff at this point. When you have something like this, you don't know who said stuff. You can't follow the flow of it. It's about control. So instead, same thing. Ow! Our dairy rubbed the spot on his arm where Silm punched him. His cousin kept his voice low so as not to be overheard. Don't assume that makes us even, pretty boy. Rolling his eyes, our dairy followed Silm to the same door Layla had disappeared through. Don't be a prairie worm of both mind and stomach, Silm. I was only hoping. You know, our dairy crashed into Silm as the older boy came to an abrupt stop. Each one of those paragraph breaks are vitally important because they allow you to see these moments in time as individual slivers. And now you can follow the action, you can follow the dialogue, you know who's saying what when, and it literally makes it to where the audience enjoys the scene. So one character's action and dialogue per paragraph. It's definitely the number one thing mistake that I see over and over and over again with newer writers. 
Thinking point two, everything in a paragraph is related. Another mistake I find is that people cram too much into a paragraph, even if they follow the above rule. Remember, the main job of a paragraph is to keep things clean and coherent for the reader. So going back to the example that I just did, what's in there is this, but what if that last line is still our dairy? So our dairy is the first part of that chapter and our dairy is the second part of the chapter. So rolling his eyes, our dairy followed the stone to the same spot Layla disappeared through, through the same door. Don't be a prayer room with both mind and stomach still and eyes only helping. You know, our dairy crashed into soon as the older boy came to an abrupt stop. Now, some of this is subjective. Some of this, you, the writer, have to decide which is better. I broke it out because it's a different action. If you're seeing something different. In the first paragraph, you're watching our dairy get frustrated with his cousin and then try to explain himself to his cousin. And then he's cut off because his cousin stops abruptly and he runs into him. It's all our dairy's action. I could roll it into one paragraph like we see below. But I don't want to because to me, it's more impactful if you see the collision between the two boys as its own separate thing. Again, subjective. Some of you out there might be thinking, no, I think it looks better as one paragraph. That's fine. It is, there is no right or wrong answer to this. That's why I wanted to use this one specifically, because it is very ambiguous. But for me, I'm always going to make those separate, because they are separate actions to me. They're very distinct from each other. One is a conversation. The other is two people running into each other. Make sense? Thing point three, and I'm going a little fast on this, because I've never given this, so I have no idea if I'm going to make it to the end um, before time runs out. Define the subject early, or the, another way to think about it is the owner of the paragraph early. To help with the above, make sure the reader knows who or what the paragraph is about as quickly as possible. In other words, the opening sentence is the most important. Don't bury the lead. So, uh, going back to that same one. Don't be a prairie worm in both mind and stomach. Sillin, eyes only helping. Following Sillin to the same door Layla had disappeared through, our dairy rolled his eyes. You know, that is a long time before we know who said any of this or did any of this. Because it's so deep in the paragraph to learn that this paragraph belongs to our dairy. That's why I didn't write it this way originally. Rolling his eyes, our dairy followed Sillin. You want to give the ownership of the paragraph to the readers as quickly as possible. Otherwise, now the readers have to read this whole long paragraph and go, who said this crap? What's going on? I, oh, it's this guy. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure we get it to them as quickly as possible because, again, it's about serving them. It's about serving the reader, giving them what they need so that they enjoy the ride better without having to work for it. They're going to have to work for figuring other stuff out, like the mystery and who did it and all that other stuff. Those are great. We definitely want them to struggle with that stuff. I don't want them to struggle with who's talking right now. Unless, you know, again, it could be a plot device, and we don't want them to know who's talking, and then I am going to make them struggle. But in this case, it's a conversation between two brothers as they're going off to breakfast. So I'm definitely not going to make them struggle with who's talking at any given time. Think of point four. Pronouns always point back to the last noun. This is an easy mistake for, most anyone, for almost anyone to make but one you should always pay attention to for the reader's sake. Again, it's about making sure the reader doesn't have to struggle to figure out what the crap you're saying. That's really what it comes down to. So pronouns always point back to the last noun. So in other words, tremors rippled through the ground behind the beast, closing fast, dropping low and lunging back. He ducked under the killing stroke, meant to end this bout in the twins' favor. The young man's sword arm slammed into his shoulder, his, so the young man's sword arm slammed into the young man's shoulder. The force of the blow sent his sword flipping away. While armor covered the twin's arm and shoulder, his armpit lay exposed. His sharp claws, wait a minute, so the twin's sharp claws dug into the spongy, unprotected flesh. I mean, if you aren't paying attention to your pronouns, things can get confusing very quickly. So in actuality, it's tremors ripping through the ground behind the beast closing fast. Dropping low and lunging back, he ducked under the killing stroke meant to end this bout in the twins' favor. The young man's sword arm slammed into the beast's shoulders. The force of the blow sent the boy's sword flipping away. 
While armor covered the twins' arm and shoulder, and yes, I have shoulder in there twice, I just realized, again, this is raw writing, that will change. His armpit lay exposed. The beast sharp dolls clenched and uh, so on and so forth. And then same thing with the bottom, it should be the boy. Sometimes you do have to make, you know, this is a fight scene. So there's a lot of things going back and forth between this twin, and that's why if you notice some of the pronouns that I use for him, he doesn't know his name. The beast does not know his name, and yes, this character is named the beast. For my primary characters, for my narrating character, I limit myself to two things, their name and their pronoun. Because anything else is insulting. And yes, you could say, well, you're calling him the beast, and that's insulting. It is, but he doesn't know his name. He only, he's a slave, he's, a, he's literally a caged thing, and he sees himself in the beginning of the story as a caged thing, and so he sees himself as the beast. That is his name to himself. So as the narrating character, I give them their name and their pronoun, and that's it. So like on our, the, the story before with our dairy, if I called our dairy the boy in his chapter, no 17-year-old boy thinks of themselves as a boy. That's insulting. And so... You don't do that. Now, our Derry is a secondary character in other POV's character, and they do call him a boy, because he is a boy to this other character. But for all other characters, I try to use a couple different delineations. I can use their name, but the Beast doesn't know this guy's name. He's about to kill him. He doesn't care. But he is a twin. There is two of them out there. You don't get to see it in this little two paragraphs. He's also a boy, because he's only about 20 years old into the Beast that's a child. Um, and he also calls him the young man. And so I do bounce back and forth, and then plus, you know, he, if I need to in there, as long as it matches up. Um, so just to, some tidbits on the whole pronoun thing. But you don't want your readers to have to think. I would rather overuse the word beast a couple times if it means the reader doesn't have to think than not overuse it and they, they get confused and they don't understand what's going on. Now, you want to do everything in your power to not overuse the beast or our dairy or whatever. You definitely want to construct your sentences in a way as to limit that. But clarity is more important to me than redundancy on a character's name or whatever, just the way it is. Thinking point five, there are many, many, many different types of sentence structures. You need to use them all. There's actually four types of sentence structures, simple, compound, complex, and compound complex. So just to go through them really quickly, because I don't want to turn this into a huge grammar uh, class, but a simple sentence has a subject and an action and maybe an object, a direct object. So the dog bit the boy that we used the other day. The dog is our subject, bit is our action, and the boy is our object. That's a simple sentence. It could also just be the dog bit or the boy was bitten. Those are all simple sentences. You want to use simple sentences. You want to rotate through and using simple sentences because it adds a lot to the story, but you don't want to overuse them. You also want to use compound sentences. Compound sentences are two simple sentences. That's really what they are. They both have, or you can have three or four, whatever. I mean, compound can have as many. Um, oh, that says independent. That should, oh, it is independent, sorry. Um, they're called independent clauses because they stand alone. So with a compound sentence, you can have two or more independent clauses, which means it has a subject and action and possibly an object. So like, the dog bit the boy and the boy ran home. You will separate it with either a conjunction and a comma, like that. The dog bit the boy, comma, and the, dog, and the boy ran home. Or, because you can separate it with a semicolon, if they are two independent clauses. That's where we use semicolons. We don't use it between um, a, an actual independent clause and a dependent clause, which we'll talk about in a second. So the dog bit the boy, semicolon, the boy ran home. They're both complete sentences. So that's a compound sentence. Complex sentence is where you have one independent clause, in other words, one complete sentence, and then any number of what's called a dependent clause. A dependent clause is a clause that isn't complete. It doesn't give the full information. So, because it was mean is not a sentence. Because, because, what, you know, because it was mean something else. That's what we're looking for. So it's a dependent clause. Because it was mean, comma, the dog bit the boy. That gets separated by a comma. One of the weird things is if the dependent clause follows the independent clause, it usually doesn't get a comma. So the dog bit the boy because it was mean doesn't get a comma. Here's the thing I love about English. Commas are really easy to understand. So if you guys struggle with commas, here's, here's a really easy rule. You always use a comma 
except for when the rule says not to use a comma, and then you never use a comma, except for when it's optional, and then you can use a comma or not. <laughs> so commas are really easy to understand. I hate commas. But there are a few things that you, like, and if, if the, just like this, if the dependent clause precedes the independent, you're going to put a comma there. If not, you're not. Uh, so there are some rules that, that are more consistent. And then you have complex compound, which is basically um, as many, um, and I didn't for some reason put examples here. Sorry. Like I said, I just created this yesterday. So there's one, there's one typo. So with a comp compound complex is where you have multiple dependent clauses and multiple independent clauses. I copied these slides and I guess I forgot to actually put some information on there. So they can get very complex. A lot of these turn into run-on sentences. But we also have, these aren't actual types of sentences, but I want to throw them in there because they are powerful and I'm going to talk about them. We have fragmented sentences. Fragmented sentences are very powerful if you use them correctly and sparingly. Don't overuse them but they really do give a punch sometimes. So like, the dog bit the boy. Hard. That word standing by itself has power. This is creative writing. It's not English. It's creative. So fragmented sentences can be really powerful. Same thing with run-on sentences. Sometimes, I will use run-on sentences a lot in descriptions. If if I want to get through a description fairly quickly and it's a mundane thing, I will probably do it as a run-on sentence. So like walking into the kitchen, Drake picked up a pot, filled it with water, and put it on the stove to heat. Everybody has boiled a pot of water. I don't care that I'm going to shove a bunch of information in there. Why am I putting this in here? Well, maybe I need Drake to do something mundane because he's a superhero and I need to connect him to the audience and the audience will go, oh, look, I've boiled water just like Drake. I must be just like him. Maybe I'm doing that. Maybe there's a ninja that's going to attack in a few seconds and Drake's going to use the pot of boiling water to throw in the, the ninja's face and I've got to plant, you know, I've got to plant that plot device first before I can use it. So maybe I'm doing that. Who knows? There's a million reasons to do it. But if it is something like this, I can get away with a run-on sentence. Get it done, get it through it, and move on. Um, with nothing else to do, they loaded up their bags, went to the train station, and caught a ride to Chicago. It's a big run-on sentence, but you know what? I'm just letting you know they went to Chicago. Just get it done, move on. So let's just go through something. Once he worked his way to the raised platform, however, the man had vanished. Clytus scanned the crowd. The hairs on the back of his neck stood at attention, and his anxiety rose to a palpable level. He weaved through the throng, relying more heavily on Sujin to press through. The enhanced strength and speed Sujin gave meant Clytus slammed into people harder than socially acceptable, earning him more than one dirty look. But he no longer cared, couldn't. Desperation clawed his mind, <clears throat> spurring him on. So one paragraph, all the different sentence structures. And it reads like butter. When you vary your sentence structure, it's more engaging, it's more interesting, the people want to keep reading. And you know, if we look through here, there's simple sentences, there's complex sentences, there's compound sentences, there's complex compound sentences, there's a fragmented sentence in there. All of those add up to making a very interesting paragraph. You want to make sure that every paragraph you write is varied. Not only that, I'll give you a side uh, piece of advice. There's several different types of information that we give in a scene. You give world building, you give scene settings, you give dialogue, you give action. Don't do those in large, massive chunks. Don't spend the first two pages info dumping the setting and the world building, and then spend three pages with dialogue, and then spend four pages with action or whatever. Mix them in. Mix them as you go through. So give a little scene setting with a little dialogue and then move into a little bit of action with a little dialogue and then maybe some scene setting, maybe some world building with some dialogue and some action and, some, and you just keep rotating through them as you're going through the scene so that you're not doing massive blocks of anything. It is so much more engaging for the reader, so much more interesting. They don't feel weighed down by three pages of backstory or three pages of anything. Work on being varied, not just in your sentence structure, but also in the information type that you're giving on every single page. And continue on with that. It really, a paragraph should flow like melted butter, in my opinion. And I'm talking about from paragraph to paragraph. So paragraphs should flow, each setting up and then leading to the next paragraph. 
Most times this means you want to write in a chronological way, concentrating on actions leading to reactions. It's sort of the same thing that I talked about in my anatomy of an action scene, where once you get in a fight scene, every sentence should be action, reaction, action, reaction, action, reaction. And the only time you want to do it in reverse is when you want to kind of confuse the reader a little bit. It is the exact same thing in constructing a scene. For the most part, you don't want the reader to have to figure out what's going on. They, they should be able to see it. They should be able to just flow through it. So, as an example, about halfway to the main exit, the slightest of tugs on the coin purse hidden under his vest came to his attention. More from surprise than need, he opened himself to the ever-present onslaught that was Su Jin. Power, power flooded through the bonding stone embedded in the palm of his right hand and would have infused his every fiber of his body had he not forcibly halted its incursion. With the speed only the essence could fuel, his hand whipped to his side and snagged the wrist of the intruding arm. Sujin enhanced strength several times greater than the strongest of men allowed him to hold the invading arm as if it were caught in stone. Shifting his position so he could look his would-be cut purse in the eye, Clytus suppressed a laugh. The man stood gaping in terror, his mind unable to comprehend how such a small person could hold him so firmly with just one hand. Of course, the cut purse towered over him. The thief was not tall by Roarthian standards, but that still put the man a good half-head taller than Clytus himself. Close-set round eyes, short-cropped dirty blonde hair, and a stubbled chin meant his face would be instantly forgettable by any who happened to notice him. Clytus pulled him closer so he could keep his voice low. I think you can find a far easier mark than I, friend. Every single paragraph leads to the next, builds upon the last. And I, I should have edited this one since it's in this thing and put Clytus' name up top. This is in the middle. We've been following Clytus and only Clytus. That's why there's a lot of he's in there because they all point back to Clytus. The whole last page was nothing but Clytus. So to, to make it better for the example, I could have put Clytus, you know, um, under, for under his vest. I could have put under Clytus's vest to kind of give you ownership of that. Um, but again, I just copied and pasted it out of my current stuff. But notice, not only is there varied sentence structure throughout the entire piece, Every paragraph is actually enhancing and leading to the next paragraph. There's world building. This is Clytus' introductory chapter. This is literally the first time the audience has ever met the magic called Su Jin. Notice I don't info dump. Why don't I info dump? Because we talked about as you know dialogue. Clytus knows he's a 45-year-old jaded mercenary that's been using Su Jin since he was about 17, 16 years old. He knows everything there is to know about it. He's not going to wonder how it works. So I'm not going to give that to my readers. I'm just going to let them experience it as it's happening, and they should be able to infer some things. Now, that farm boy that you meet, our dairy, is going to get it for the first time. So he's what's called an anchor character. Anchor characters ask a bunch of stupid questions to give that information to the reader, because that's really what they're there for. So yes, we'll get into Sujin and what it is and how it works and where it comes from and all that other great stuff later when the two meet up and Clytus has to teach him how to be a Tetsujin. Um, so I'm not info dumping, but there's still world building. There's still things going on. I'm still doing description, so I'm scene setting. You get to see, now obviously there's no scene setting in, in this section because I've already set that. We're already in a little crowded market kind of area that's all been set up on literally the page before it. So you don't get it in this example. Just trust me, it's there. Um, and so if you were reading this, you already can see that you're in a big crowd and there's stuff around you and I've already done all that legwork. So I don't need to do it a second time. I do bring it back. So that thing that I read earlier where he's pushing through the crowd actually happens after this scene. So I bring the crowd back into it to show you, oh yeah, he is in this big crowd. I'm reminding you of that. But this is what we want it to do. This is what we want our paragraphs to do. We want them to flow Everything is in an action, reaction, action, reaction. There's still world building. There's still scene setting. There's still stuff going on. And it's all enhancing the next version. It forces the reader to go, ooh, that's interesting. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And we want them to keep flowing through it. Thinking point seven, transitions are everything. Yes, scene breaks are powerful things. That's a scene break. It's a fake one. But... It's what a lot of us use in unpublished manuscripts. You use a little tilde, asterisk tilde. What a scene break does, it allows the reader to know that something major has changed. We've moved in location. We've moved in time. We've gone into a flashback. We've come back from a flashback. Whatever. We changed POV heads. However, what if you're not going to use a scene break? 
What if you're just going to flow from one paragraph to another and you're going to do something major? You're going to change. You're going to go into a, flash, a flashback or whatever. You must spend extra time on these. They must not lose the reader. They must be understandable. And we'll see how understandable this is. This is actually like a three-page thing that I cut down to just a little paragraph. So I cut a bunch of stuff out. We'll see how it reads. So, oh, well, this is back to the boys. Dancing from the room, our dairy giggled at the sound of Sion's trundle groaning as his cousin fought for release. Our dairy bound down the stairs, knowing the older boy would retaliate, late, retaliate later. Still, the slap on the head, or the slap had served, he slapped him in the head. Still, the slap had served its purpose and would force his cousin to rise and give chase. Whatever works. As with most morns, instead of entering the dining hall through the door that sat across from the foot of the stairs, our dairy took the long way around and through the kitchens. Wives, daughters, and grandmothers greeted him as he entered. They bustled to and fro, preparing first meal. So we just went from upstairs to downstairs. You have to pay attention to your transitions. I, the, the inner monologue of whatever works is my way of going, I'm done with that, now let's move on to something else. So we're just, we're just making sure that the reader can follow the action without getting lost. Now, everybody does that. That's not really a hard one. I threw it in here just to kind of start the process. Where most people have trouble with is um, in, and it's still the same thingy point, is in flashbacks. That's where a lot of people lose me when I'm reading unpublished work or when I'm critiquing other people's. I, they lose me going from the now to the flashback or going from the flashback to the now. And you just have to pay attention to it. You have to make sure that you can keep the reader's focus where you want it to go so that they understand what's going on. So, and again, I just pulled this out. We'll see if this actually works. Get out of my mind. It took all the beast's strength to, to simply form those words inside his skull. Within a heartbeat, he lost the fight against his mental against this mental onslaught and found himself standing in a vast emptiness, darkness stretching out on every side. Pulled from the deepest wells of his memory, the beast's history burst to life around him. From the fathomless darkness, images of what his parents must have looked like took shape more vividly than any dream. So he's in a mental fight, and then he gives up, and now we're somewhere else. I could scene break. I don't want to. I, I want you to have to live this all at one moment. But I don't lose my reader. I make sure they understand we are no longer where you thought we were. We're not in his cell anymore. We're inside of his head. We're somewhere else. And then at the end of this, coming out of it is the same thing. The images faded away to blackness, for the beast's, memory, for the beast's memories ended there. Remorse beset his mind, an emotion that did not come from him. He once again stood in his tiny cell, gaze locked on the strange honored ones. Thin, semi-trent parent sheet slid up from the bottom of the blue-gray blue visitor's globe-like eyes. Is it remorse or pity? The being averted its gaze before disappearing from the window. The sudden withdrawal shattered the hold on the beast's mind. He staggered from the abrupt release, his muscles draining from having been under constant tension throughout the ordeal. So again, I'm just coming out. I'm making sure that the way I write the transition from the flashback part of it into the now of the story the reader's not going to get lost. They're going to go, oh, okay, yeah, no, we're back. And I even say, like, literally, it's, you don't have to be clever about this stuff. You know, he once again stood in the tiny cell. He never actually left the tiny cell. Like, he was there when the memory rape started, and he's there after it's done. And that's it. But I want to make sure that I think about this. Transitions are very, very important, especially into and out of flashbacks. Don't lose your readers. Vitally important. Think of point eight. Each paragraph should leave the reader wanting more. And I know it sounds cliche, but every single paragraph should entice the reader to read the next paragraph. Again, it's a part of that. I want everyone to enhance the next one. Everyone should feed into the next one. If you get to the point where, because this happened last night. We, I did have a writer's group last night. Um, so when I left here, I went home and and critiqued other people. And when, this one woman who read, we were like, look, this whole section needs to happen up here. 
You've done this out of order. Basically, she had a character doing a mental freak out. Then she had somebody that was doing a bunch of stuff that he really can't even see because he's mentally freaking out and he's focusing on something completely different. And then she talks about the fact that he can't actually hear anything that we just heard and all the conversation that just took place because he's having a mental freak out. And then somebody pulls him out of that. I'm like, look at the order that you're doing this in. You can't have us live a moment that your narrating character can't live, that he's not focused on. You have to do something else. So you know, my suggestion to her was something like, make, turn the background into a buzz. You know, say something like, and then they continue talking, but he heard none of it. Something like that, anything, will give you that kind of segue in. Because it is about the order of information dissemination. We want the reader to get the order the way they need to get it so they're no longer struggling. And then when I said that, the other people would say, were like, oh yeah, no, I, that would really make me care now. Because one of the guys was like, yeah, I actually didn't care and I didn't understand why. And, but now that you've mentioned that, that's it. If that had happened sooner and then it comes out of it, I would actually feel the struggle at that point. So the order of your stuff is very, very important because it will impact how the reader actually relates to what's being read. So be very, very cognizant of that as you're going through it. And yeah, like I said, it's cliche. And then last, when do we end a paragraph? How long should a paragraph be? Well, and again, this is cliche too, but it, it should be as long as it needs to be to do its goal. Like I get, so many people ask me about scenes too. Like, well, how many words should a scene be? They, they should be as many words to accomplish what they need to accomplish. I mean, I, I have scenes that are nine, ten thousand 10,000 words long, and I have scenes that are 300 words long. Like, whatever. However it works to work out, that's how it works to work out. I don't care. Um, and I don't think you should either. I think that's actually, you're hurting yourself if you're like, oh, it can't be longer than this, or it must be at least this long. Let the paragraphs do, I mean, I have one word paragraphs. So like that one example of the dog bit the boy, hard, if you, not only if you break out that word does it have more impact, but think about breaking out in its own paragraph. So like in the, the beast chapter at the beginning, he's laying and he's looking up at the uh, ceiling and it says something about um, the beam stretched out like, a, like the fingers of a giant hand reminding him of his master's hold upon him that his life was not his own. Um, something, I can't remember exactly. But anyway, there's, there is a moment where it says um, foreboding and something else. And there are two different words that are set off as their own paragraphs. And they're so powerful when you have them out as their own paragraphs because it forces the reader to really take stock of the word foreboding. Its own paragraph, its own sentence, its own everything. It really has impact. However, don't do it every page. <laughs> like, because then it waters it down and it's no longer impactful if every other word is a, a single word paragraph. It loses its value. But once per scene, once every four or five chapters, those are some powerful stuff to do. You know, you take advantage of that. Same thing with cadence. Some, you know, we don't like to repeat ourselves. Like I pop myself for writing shoulder twice in two paragraphs. And I will be changing that because that was terrible. But sometimes a cadence works really well. You know, where you have this poetic, you know, he knew he couldn't do it. He knew he shouldn't do it. He knew he wouldn't do it. I just made that up. It's, I'm going to say that's good. But that, that, that may be a very powerful moment in that scene using that cadence through there. But again once every couple of chapters at most. You know, don't use that too often or you weaken the fact that you're using this cadence going through there. So that's it, I went really fast, so we still have some time for Q and A's. And if you guys got questions, because th this was a lot. Um, and again, first time I've given it, so I got a bunch of ideas to add to it for the next time, for people that aren't you that get to get benefit from that. But do join the giveaway, drakeu.com forward slash giveaway. Do use the code if you wanna buy the package. Um, 20 books, 22. So I do have about 10 minutes. Does anybody have any paragraph related questions? Anything I said that, that I didn't explain good enough that you would like a little bit more information on? I don't know. I don't remember it. Yeah, it was just a tag on to, to one. So yeah, one is that it's only one character's action and dialogue, and yeah, but two is everything is related. So in other words, like, like I said, um, if we're gonna jump time, let's say we're gonna go an entire season, 
And it says, like I, like I said, months rolled on, the snow fell and then melted. It's all related because it's all related to the passage of this season or this time or this whatever. That can all be one paragraph because it's related to what the topic of the paragraph is accomplishing. Yes? Too much space between, like double space between the paragraphs? <clears throat> so she's basically saying taking a bigger paragraph and just chopping it up into just randomly making them smaller. Um, maybe. I mean, one of the things about me is I'm an epic fantasy writer, so I'm going to put a lot more detail in my stuff than other genres are going to be. So you, some of you aren't, who aren't epic fantasy fans might have been reading some of these examples going, wow, that's really wordy. It is. But there's a reason why epic fantasy fans want 200,000-word books and not 80,000-word books that you cozy mystery writers get to write, or 70,000 or whatever pathetic amount of few words that you use. <laughs> um, like, it's definitely not going to hold down, you know, papers in a windstorm is all I'm saying. Mine are... <laughs> Um, my mind, you might actually hold you down in a windstorm. But maybe, you know, again, this, a lot of this is subjective. Like that first example where I talked about our dairy bumping into his cousin. Technically, those are all kind of still happening at the same time, and they're all happening to our dairy, so we could connect them together or we could separate them out. So some of this is subjective. Um, depends on what's going on. In, in a fight scene, my paragraphs tend to be shorter because we're going attack, 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 attack. And so I want to bounce back and forth between the two as they're doing stuff. I don't want to have like three pair, you know, this big, long, massive paragraph of, and then the beast punched him and kicked him and bit him and slapped him and bit him and slapped him and kicked him and slapped him. And then the other guy dodged. Like, that's a long time for this thing to happen. So those paragraphs tend to be much smaller because I am doing this sliver of time. My slivers become smaller because we're in a fight. So each, each paragraph now might be you know, a fraction of a second as opposed to three seconds or four. Like in the kitchen scene, time is not a, important. We're just, we're, we just woke up and we're in, you know, everybody's done that with your siblings or family or whatever. You've been in kitchen and you're bantering back and forth and it's a lot of that. Uh, so those paragraphs tend to be a little bit longer because time doesn't mean as much and, you know, it's, it's whatever. And so that is definitely off of pacing. But I wouldn't just chop up I don't think there's a rule that you could follow that says if your paragraph is seven lines long, you should chop it up into three paragraphs. Like, it depends. If it is an action scene, if it is something that you want to make it feel like it's moving faster, yeah, shorter paragraphs. Again, like I said in the beginning, punctuation is where people swallow. It's where they consume that piece of information and move on to the next one. That's why run-on sentences, unless there's something that's completely related or bad, because you're making me, you know, like Spider-Man jumped to the ledge, landed in a crouch, shot a web across the street, connecting it to the fire escape, and then leaped off into the, to the air. Like, that's a lot of stuff going on in one sentence. It's also bad. I just made it up on the spot. But I don't want a reader to have to swallow that in one bite. I want them to savor each little bite um, I don't write a lot of prophetic stuff, but I wrote this the other day for my marketing team. I said something like, every sentence should be a meal, every paragraph a feast. And so that's what, that's what I want. I want, you know, every single thing to give you something that's enjoyable instead of cramming a bunch of food in your mouth all at one time. So could you divide it up? Sure. It depends on what you're trying to do, but I would do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I would go, man, this is supposed to be an action scene, and these are some really long paragraphs. Could I divide it up a little bit different? But even on that case, I might not just chop them up like that. I might go, can I actually divide the action up? So in other words, let's say I have a big paragraph and a big paragraph and a big paragraph. So character A, character B, and character C, or character A again. I might go, can I take a sliver of the character B one and move it between here? And you know what I mean? I might actually rework the scene so that it's moving faster as opposed to just going, well, I'm just going to break this up, this character A into three sentences, and then, or three paragraphs, and then character B into three paragraphs, and character A back to three paragraphs. That might not help you with your pacing, even though they're smaller paragraphs.
Does that make sense? So I really think it should be a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think there's going to be a hard and fast rule on you have to do it this way. Anyone else? We should have time for one more question. Well, let me ask a question. I got some ideas. Again, this is new class. Do you guys feel it was worth it? You got something out of it. All right. That's always my concern. All right, well, I am going to be out there for another 30 minutes to an hour or whatever. When people stop coming up to me, I'm going to leave. So um, you guys have me as long as you need me. But I will be out there. If somebody wants to pick up a book that didn't pick up a book, I have my I also do take credit cards. Uh, so out there on that, if you have questions, let me know. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys very much. Have a great rest of the convention. And safe travels home, because I live here. So but literally, in this convention, I just I rent a room upstairs. <laughs>